Good evening, everyone. My name is Lauren Dancer, and I'm a second secretary in the Australian High Commission here in New Delhi. Um, I'm currently looking after trade and economic cooperation between Australia and India. Um, so, first of all, welcome. It's wonderful to have you all here post Diwali, um, and I hope that you all did have wonderful Diwali celebrations. Um, this month's episode of Stay Connected, Stay Informed, Shape the Future uh, brings together three Australian alumni who are leaders and innovators in the agriculture and agribusiness space. Before we begin this evening's discussion, a quick reminder on some health rules. Please keep yourself on mute at all times to avoid disturbing the proceedings. If you have any bandwidth or internet issues, please try switching off your video and joining in audio only mode. If you drop out, please do try logging in again and rejoining. If we drop out due to network issues on our end, please be patient, hang in there, we'll join back in quickly. The chat room is open and we welcome you all to interact and connect there. Um, and finally, we've received quite a few questions on tonight's topic. So we've reached out to some of you who sent in questions and we'll be inviting you to ask your question during the Q&A session. And if we have any time left at the end, we'll open up to, to questions from the virtual floor, so to speak. Um, agriculture has been a key and champion sector in the Indian economy for decades. Um, it's not only the highest employment generating sector in the country, but also one which is rapidly changing. It reflects India's fast growing domestic market, as well as increasing demand for Indian food products in the international market. Um, and to speak to us more about the changes and in innovations that we're seeing in India's agriculture sector, we have an esteemed panel of Australian alumni with us this evening. Uh, we have Dr. Hamid Singh Sidhu, Sachin Darbava, and Vishal Mahindra Gada. But first, I'd like to invite the High Commissioner to make some opening remarks to begin tonight's conversation. Over to you, High Commissioner. Well, good day to you all, and a belated uh, happy Diwali to you all as well. Uh, I'm delighted you've again joined us for our monthly rendezvous where we seek to acknowledge the wonderful work that uh, Australian alumni do in India. Now, before I start, can I just reinforce what Lauren asked? Those who have their microphones open, could you close them? Because I'm hearing distortion here already. So if you can just turn your mics off until you speak, that will help everybody. It's apt that this event occurs close to two occasions which celebrate our nation's farm sectors. Tomorrow is Australia's National Agricultural Day and, of course, India's Kisan Divas next month. As in Australia, the Indian agricultural sector remains critical and a critical sector for our economy and one that holds immense potential. Farmers, agriculture and agribusinesses are part of both our country's identities and cultures. Recognising this, the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership signed by our Prime Ministers earlier this year, identified agriculture as a key sector for cooperation. India's overall food demand is expected to grow 2-3% to 3 until 2025, and the gap between demand and supply will outgrow by 2035, primarily in pulses, grains, oil seeds, fruit and vegetables. And this is where the complementarity of our respective agricultural sectors comes into play. Australia is known internationally for its safe and high quality food and fibre production. Australian food and fibre producers make more than we can consume, with around 80% of our production exported to the world, supporting global food security. Currently annual two-way agricultural fisheries and forestry trade between India and Australia is valued at around a billion dollars. While this is solid, it's underdone compared to both countries' trade with other key partners, which leaves plenty of opportunities open for Indian and Australian farmers. In the context of COVID, Australia and India need to explore trade opportunities for our farmers in a post-pandemic world where access to safe, reliable food will be more important than ever. Australia also offers specialised, clean, green, safe and secure supply products that complement India's agricultural production rather than compete with it. The last thing Australia wants to do is to undercut any country's farmers. And given the vastly different scale between Australia and India, 
this is an unrealistic fear. Opportunities are also emerging for value-added products sought by India's growing middle class and for providing specialised services to governments, institutions and farmers. We also provide inputs into Indian manufacturing. Australia remains the world's largest fine and super wool producer, but is reliant on foreign processes to add value to our raw wool products. It's a win-win, with India having the downstream processes and textile industries to use Australian wool to make garments and even shoes to export to the world. I should add when I talk about wool, we're also adding to the Indian flock of sheep. Uh, last year saw the import uh, of a number of rams uh, into India to improve uh, the quality of your wool. Both countries have also made strong progress in market access matters for the benefit of exporters and farmers. Australia has gained access for the import of Indian pomegranates and an approved additional facility for the export of Indian mangoes to Australia. India has made changes to accepted quarantine treatments for Australian malting barley and horticultural products. Hopefully, this list will continue to grow, particularly while I'm here in India. There's also numerous examples of strong partnerships between Australia and India in agriculture. One focused on developing multi-scale climate change adaptation strategy for farming communities is a collaboration between Indian and Australian institutions funded by the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research. Three pilot centres, which combine traditional and scientific knowledge of weather to inform farm management decisions were established and their success led to the subsequent funding of a further 33 centres in Telangana alone. Prime Minister Modi's vision of a self-reliant India makes it imperative for India to boost its agribusiness. As the Climate Information Centre example shows, Australia can contribute to realising this objective by sharing significant agricultural expertise to improve India's food security, sustainability and food system, uh, food system resilience. Australia has world-class expertise in high safety standards, adoption of clean and green technologies, agri-services and land and water resource management, which can be leveraged with India and which we're keen to share. I'm glad our alumni panellists are breaking new ground within the agricultural sector. They all play a crucial role here, in Australia, uh, here and in Australia. And I look forward to hearing more about what the future holds for agriculture. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, High Commissioner. It's clear that there's incredible potential for collaboration between Australia and India in the agriculture sector. And now I'd like to call on our first panellist for the evening to speak, Dr. Harminder Singh Sidhu, who's been actively working in the space for decades to realise that potential. Thank you, Dr. Sidhu. Good evening. And uh, my name is Harminder Singh Sidhu. I was a professor of agriculture and engineering and, uh, in Punjab Agriculture University uh, till 2009. And by my training, I'm an agriculture engineer and uh, working in the farm machinery, agricultural machinery sector. Now for the last 10 years, I'm working for CIMIT in Boardlog Institute for South Asia. And our main aim is uh, sustainable intensification uh, program in agriculture, how we can grow more with less of water, less of nutrient and less of energy. And at the same time, sustaining our all natural resources. So I'm I'm basically working in the team of sustainable intensification program in cement as well as in BISA. And if uh, I if I see my connection with Australia, I when I was in the university, uh, Punjab Agriculture University, I started working with Australian Centre for International Agriculture Research (ACIR) uh, on a project uh, which was an India Australia collaborative project. Uh, on managing crop residue um, in the field. So uh, I think I worked with the Australian, uh, Australian team as well as my Australian uh, scientist uh, for, for at least for seven to eight years till, till 2009. And then the outcome of this, that project uh, is a machine uh, which is uh, 
called happy cedar and uh, and uh, now uh, because we are all talking about covid 19 and the importance of that machine is more now and if you if we see in the last two years uh, it is like more than 14000 machines are already uh, working on the farmer fields and uh, in as far as uh, the last year uh, uh, data from the remote sensing uh, almost half a million i'm just talking about punjab half a million hectare uh, area was uh, sown with the with the happy cedar without uh, without burning a rice residue and uh, and uh, the farmer did the next uh, seeding in a single pass so this is uh, this is an amazing machine for conservation agriculture and which not only save your water not only save your time and not only save your uh, energy but at the same time uh, we uh, because the mulch is lying on the surface we are suppressing weeds and and it is coping up with climate change and terminal heat etc so uh, this is my connection yeah and uh, for this uh, for the for the like uh, benefit of the audience i have uh, a small video 55 second video how how the system is working I, uh, on the on the yes on in the field so uh, so i will i will share that lauren can i go yeah what you say so can you can you see my screen now yes yes okay so so this is uh, when we harvest rice at that time in punjab i am talking about northwest india not only punjab haryana and western up we have a sufficient residual moisture at the ground so if we harvest uh, our uh, our rice uh, with the, with the combine having a super straw management at the back and then now this field is ready for me for seeding my next crop so the harvesting of the first crop and seeding of the next crop is is uh, at the same time and you need only now you can see the two happy seeders are working in the field and it is a, a single pass operation for for seeding your next crop so uh, uh, this is harvesting your rice and seeding your uh, wheat uh, in a single pass at the same time that means you need only a zero turnover period and that is uh, that is uh, uh, that is how it is uh, pe people are now using it on large area as i said in the last year it was on half a million hectare in punjab and we always call that this is a path to sustainable agriculture which is a machine happy seeder so uh, thank you uh, uh, for 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 seeing it and if you have a, some question on this machine or or our work and uh, we are not only uh, like uh, promoting sustainable intensification only in a sense that we are saving uh, environment but at the same time i think as an agriculture uh, scientist soil health and the, our natural source basically water is more important so this is all from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sidhu. And I neglected to mention at the start that Dr. Sidhu is a principal research engineer with the Borlaug Institute for South Asia, um, which is the first institute, international institute of its kind in North India. Um, as you've heard, he's been working in the agricultural research sector in relation to conservation agriculture for decades. And that's led to the to the Happy Cedar project and the work that you've seen just now um, and incredible progress in sustainable agriculture. And there's no doubt that that kind of innovation, that kind of project work is going to be very fundamental um, to overcoming global challenges such as pollution, climate change. Um, so we really welcome the opportunity to hear from Dr. Sidhu about his work. We'll now move over to our next speaker, Sachin Darbarar, who is a seasoned professional and innovator in the agribusiness space. Um, Sachin Darbarar is the founder and CEO of Simply Fresh Hyderabad. 
He's an alumnus of the University of Sydney, where he pursued his master's in IT project management, followed by studies in plant technology. And during his time in Australia, he worked across both the information technology and the agriculture technology and farming technique sectors. Uh, he was the youngest IT project manager at Commonwealth Bank in Australia, and he ventured more recently into the agri-tech space. Uh, so here he is to tell us more about that journey. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. So my name is Sachin Darbarwar. Uh, I was in Australia for good uh, eight years. And uh, before that, was, I was in uh, New Zealand. I did my master's in uh, Sydney Uni. And uh, during that time, I got... Uh, uh, had an opportunity to visit the COVID uh, campus of Sydney Uni, where they were doing a lot of plant breeding. And uh, they were having a little bit of issues uh, around the uh, concept of talking to the plants. And that's where I got very fascinated about uh, the technology, what is the potential, and is it possible to scale it up? And I started doing a little bit of experiments in the backyard and then uh, realized there are a lot of consultants, there are a lot of uh, growers in Australia who have already been uh, doing that and uh, then started working with a lot of consultants in Australia who have a lot of knowledge uh, in uh, this space uh, where it comes to precision ag and uh, hydroponic and uh, growing in uh, greenhouses where India and, India and Australia do share the similar climatic condition, especially the region where I belong to, uh, Hyderabad and uh, Sydney I was uh, living. So there were a lot of synergies between technologies which were used in Australia and India because uh, everybody was looking up to Netherlands but Netherlands was mostly experienced growing uh, in a cooler climate. They are very good to grow uh, vegetables and uh, fruits in a cooler climate. But whereas for India we need uh, the technologies and the learnings from a climate which is very similar to us. And uh, then we started collaborating with a lot of companies in Australia. We started up our first project in Hyderabad, me and my wife, and we had a five-year-old son. We all moved here to start up this project. And uh, my son was missing the strawberries from Australia and a lot of things for the first year. So it was a big challenge, but uh, slowly we settled him and we started the company called Simply Fresh. Uh, a couple of years, we did a lot of R&D and uh, again, been working very close with Australian consultants and uh, other growers, we had yeah. a lot of growers visiting us. Right. Uh, so. Okay, critical thing. Hello. Okay, yeah. Sit here one second, Trisha. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah sure. we've just got some people with open microphones. If they can close yeah. microphones unless they're talking. Thank you. Uh, no problem. So uh, we had a lot of uh, farmers and uh, growers visiting us in Hyderabad from Australia. And uh, some of them stayed with us for a good six months, which was very interesting uh, for them and for also to learn how to work in this country. And uh, after a couple of years when the project was successful, we went for uh, fundraising. George, George Tyrion, could you turn your microphone off, please? Okay. Sorry, station. No, no. Sachin, please continue. Yeah, thank you. So uh, then um, when the project was successful, when people saw that the quality of vegetables, if you walk into a supermarket in Australia, the vegetables are so inviting, they're so beautiful. Whereas when we used to go into the supermarket in India, the vegetables were not that inviting, they were not that fresh. So we said affordable food safety, how can we bring it? And then we went for fundraising and we raised close to $40 million. And we continued our partnership with our Australian uh, colleagues and uh, Australian growers. We set up a huge facility. If you guys permit, I will just show you a two minutes video. Uh, Amin, if you could uh, share the screen, please. Sure, I'll just put it up. I hope everybody is able to see my screen. I'll just play the video. Yes, you can see it. Thank <sighs> you. 
Should be fine, Amit. Thank you. So uh, basically, it's it's a very good example of uh, what uh, we could learn, what we could uh, take from Australia and uh, replicate here on a larger scale. And still today, we have a daily calls with the team in Australia, and it's just the beginning. And uh, as you rightly said, it's a beginning for uh, high tech agri in India, and uh, that's the space we are in today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sachin. It's it's great to hear that the synergies between Australia and India, especially in terms of climate, really make it possible to take ideas from one to the other um, and progress them. It's also really great to hear that there's demand for strawberries here. So that's something, that's an idea someone will need to take up <laughs> so that your son can enjoy them again. I now invite our last speaker, um, Vishal Mahindra Gada to talk about his journey from the world of finance and banking to the agribusiness space. So another panelist that's that's um, that's gone on a foray into a new area. Um, Vishal Mahindra Gada is the co-founder and director of Auroc Agro Products. Uh, he's an alumnus of Macquarie University and holds a double masters in finance and accounts. Uh, he's a professionally qualified CPA and CFA from Australia. Um, in Australia, he worked in investment banking and specialized in mining, but following his return to India, he continued working in the space, but then set up his own company, the Bentonite Mining Business. Uh, since then, he's diversified into the agribusiness sector uh, and is a pioneer through his business in growing dragon fruit in India. So here to tell us more about it is Vishal Vahindra Gada. Thanks, Lauren, for the introduction. Uh, basically, uh, when I was in Australia, I was more, as you said, uh, in the accounts and finance space, working in investment banking. Uh, and when I came back to India, I was partners with Bly Capital into investment banking, and we've helped a lot of uh, Indian companies to invest in Australia in the mining space. And then the mining industry was coming off, so we started helping all the agricultural companies uh, to do business in India, and that's where we were helping Seed Genetics, which was, which in fact is the largest uh, fodder seed, uh, fodder seed exporter from uh, Adelaide. Uh, so we helped them do trial research across India, a uh, lot of centers across India, uh, and that's where we ourselves ventured into seed production business. So we've sort of got a tripartite agreement with Seed Genetics, uh, UPL Advanta, and ourselves uh, for growing fodder seeds, uh, alpha alpha loosen seeds in India. But then uh, the company was taken over by uh, a Nasdaq listed company, uh, so this project was shelled off. But meanwhile, we ourselves thought that you know Agri is a very good space and uh, it would be the future. So that's where uh, we were plenty of land in Kutch. Uh, so we started uh, looking at options that we can grow in the region. So uh, our Kutch is famous for Kesar mangoes, which is one of the sweetest mangoes you can get. Uh, dates, Bahari, and the local variety. So the fresh dates, not the dates that we get from Middle East, which is ripened over the tree. And thirdly, the pomegranates. We did a lot of, you know, uh, study uh, the pros, cons on these products, and then uh, we thought, what what else can we do? So we thought that, you know, Kutch is a arid zone, so cactus uh, would be best, and fruit-bearing cactus, so dragon fruit was one of them. And with our Austin links and all, we got in touch with Marcus uh, from Northern Territory. He's the largest dragon fruit grower in Australia. So we discussed a lot of things with him, and then uh, finally we imported our uh, dragon fruit plantations from uh, Sri Lanka, which is the Taiwanese variety. Uh, initially, we faced a lot of challenges uh, in growing dragon fruit because we are not from the agri background, so we did not have a lot of soil knowledge and all. So we kept consultant to uh, run us through, but then. Uh, uh, we faced issues with the consultants, and then we thought of going uh, organic, and we started, you know, following Subhash Palekar uh, method of zero budget natural farming, and uh, we, we grow a lot of trees and other stuff on our own land to provide our own uh, biofertilizers and biopesticides. 
we use a lot of cow dance we we uh, do a lot of charity so if there's a cow uh, cow shelter around a region we built a biogas plant out there so we use the slurry uh, in our farms uh, we grow fodder between uh, our dragon fruit plantations we give fodder in return to them as well uh, so that's how our uh, journey started and basically we are certified organic uh, uh, growers of dragon fruit so what started six years back as a uh, as a premier project of 15 acres our self project uh, we are now uh, 65 acres of our own project uh, and we are consulting across 300 acres across india right from sicily Gurti in the east uh, to uh, srinagar north and downwards hyderabad so we give consultancy to our clients uh, farmer clients uh, right from helping them with bank finance uh, provide them uh, planting material, uh, share knowledge on how to grow the, the plant management, and we even assist them in the sales. Another challenge what we faced is dragon fruit, the generally the imported uh, dragon fruit, the, which anyone might have tried, is white from inside and mainly imported from Vietnam, which is very bland. So that was the biggest challenge that we faced when our dragon fruit, which was red in variety, when it came in market, a lot of the APMC sellers also said that, you know, we've injected red color into it and maybe added some sweetness. But uh, since we are organic and, you know, we, we had we had a lot of time uh, difficulty in explaining them. But then we had our own distribution channels where we uh, in the brand called Maisha, where we are distributing across Bombay. And now we are venturing into other cities as well. So we are supplying in Sangli, Hyderabad, Ahmedabad and other places and we are even uh, selling our uh, farmer produce as well in these channels and now we are expanding into other products as well uh, and also uh, doing a lot of research on other products that can be done in the region of Kutch. and looking at the covid period uh, there are you know a lot of people have you know lost businesses or jobs and all so they're looking at opportunities in the agri space and that's where we are helping them in Kutch or elsewhere uh, in different spaces. The biggest challenge that uh, India is facing is fragmented lands. So uh, using of you know, uh, machineries and all becomes very uh, uh, financially you know, stressful for a lot of farmers. So that's where we are helping them you know, to combine land and grow uh, unifiedly what, what we've seen in Vietnam, uh, creating clusters and uh, growing uh, something good. That's what we are doing. Uh, and yes, uh, looking at uh, importing a lot of fruits from different places. Uh, currently, we're trading and we are looking at various options. So, yeah, so we are growing our business uh, that way, especially in dragon fruit. Thanks. Thanks so much, Vishal. It's so great to hear your sort of personal experiences of what some of the challenges are of, of growing a business in the agricultural sector and, and, and growing products and how plant management technologies, um, organic farming techniques have sort of helped to manage some of those, those challenges um, as well, I'm sure, as an investment outlook. It's also great to sort of come full circle and hear about the importance of looking at agriculture in a sustainable way and about the importance of the machinery that Dr. Haminda spoke about earlier comes in, in terms of managing um, those challenges and risks over the longer term. Um, before we draw the audience into this discussion, um, we have one question we wanted to put to all three of our panelists this evening, um, and that is, I'd like to ask each of you what, in your opinion, are some of the key areas where Australia and India can collaborate further in the agriculture and agribusiness space? Um, so, Dr. Haminda, perhaps we could start with you. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I, I think, uh, one of the best area could be like institutional uh, linkages where we can learn the best practices of each other. And uh, I think like uh, in, in our sector where I'm in the crop production sector also, like when, when you are moving from, from a business as a usual to, to a new technology or to a new practice, then, then you need a lot of capacity building not only uh, of the farmers uh, starting all the stakeholders starting from the 
manufacturer, scientist, and field functionaries. Then, then like it is, it is really like because because in agriculture or in in the field crops, seeing is always a believing, right? If they can, if they grow on their field and see the crop is coming up nicely with the less efforts, with less energy, and at the same time it is improving their soil health and they are saving on the water. I think that part is like very important so that if we can uh, we have institution linkages and we can learn the best practices uh, from each uh, other and and help each other in a capacity building program that is i think like like that is i think a missing link when you are moving from uh, a, a conventional agriculture to uh, to a precision agriculture or to a to a conservation agriculture or like sustainable agriculture i think the capacity building is uh, a key thing, and the institutional linkages to where where our like we can link the people or or the partners. Like even even I I think uh, one of the one of my project we do some traveling seminar also. Even even uh, 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 every year uh, for the last two three years, the farmers from Australia they used to visit us, and uh, uh, and even the manufacturer and other. So that the the change is very important, I, I I think. So so that is from my side. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Sidhu and Sachin. Do you have any comments to add? Uh, a bit in there in Australia, because uh, the hydroponic uh, space or say aquaponic space or growing inside the greenhouses, I think there is a lot of scope where Australia and India can work together because that's the space where uh, you are able to grow sustainably and you are able to get better yield, safe produce. And Australia has already been doing that for so many years under similar climatic conditions. So there is a lot of technical know-how which could be shared between the countries. There could be a lot of uh, team members like uh, uh, Harminder Singh sir was saying uh, for capacity building can be sent to Australia for the training. They can work in the greenhouses there. Uh, there is a different uh, skill set they can pick up, different discipline, different learning, and the kind of conditions they can work there and understand. That would be uh, uh, one avenue I feel uh, is um, uh, open because uh, uh, just recently I've seen a lot of corporates are interested in agri now. Previously it was not big corporates were not getting into it because there was no predictability. There was no guaranteed uh, output. With Precision Ag, uh, it is more working like a plant factory. We, we call ourselves as a plant factories because we are able to predict the yield uh, plus minus 10% and we don't have any seasonality. We are able to choose the crop which market needs rather than growing what uh, the region supports. So we are able to manipulate the climate. We are able to control a lot of things. We are able to import good quality seeds. And Hyderabad is strategically positioned uh, for exports. We can export to a lot of countries which are uh, within uh, you know eight to 10 hours from Hyderabad. So there is a lot of potential in this space. Plus Indian middle class and upper middle class demanding more and more safe produce. And uh, it is possible to do it in the soil base, uh, but the way the world is moving uh, towards sustainability, uh, less water, uh, cleaner product, safe product, traceable product. We, we store 64 steps right from seed till harvest. So there is a lot of scope in this space. And uh, whatever we are able to produce, we are uh, fully booked out till March. We don't have a single kg to spare. So there is, there is beautiful demand uh, for quality and a safe produce. And I think we are just a drop in the ocean and uh, it's a new sector, new segment, a lot of scope is there to grow. So I, I personally feel uh, the high tech uh, growing uh, space, there is a lot of uh, synergies between Australia and India to collaborate. Fantastic. Thanks, Sachin and Vishal. Yeah. Uh -huh. So basically, as I said, uh, we ventured into agriculture with seed genetics uh, for, with the fodder seeds. So fodder, uh, cattle population in India is quite large. So fodder seeds is something that can be looked at uh, uh, India-Australia collaboration. 
so more, uh, you know, like the lucent seeds and the other rye grass or something that can be grown into India. Another thing, uh, as uh, the High Commissioner said, that uh, there's an Indo-Australian uh, uh, center of excellence on the weather. I would recommend uh, more uh, to do with uh, uh, some horticultural crops, something on the lines of, say, Indo-Israel or the Indo-Dutch uh, uh, center of excellence, more on the grape side or citrus fruits or any other fruits that uh, strawberries, uh, what Sachin said his son misses. That's something, you know, that can be looked at uh, growing in India with the Australian technology. Uh, another thing that can be looked at is uh, more of the trade between the two countries. Like, for instance, uh, currently avocados we are getting only from, say, Chile or some other plots. So that can be got from Australia. Uh, mangoes being exported out. So, as I said, Kesar mangoes are grown in India that can be exported into Australia. So a lot of synergies in terms of trades that can be looked at. And uh, since we are venturing uh, into this space, it would be a good help uh, for us uh, to look into this. So these are the few points that uh, you know India and, India and Australia can be working together on. Thanks so much, everyone. It's it's great to hear your thoughts on how we can better demonstrate experiences and, and technology um, across both our countries and how we can grow trade and grow business opportunities. Um, I have another question um, that we've received for all three panelists, and that is how to combine India's strengths in technology and finance um, so that those um, areas of India's strength flow on and benefit the agriculture sector. Um, so again, can I can I ask Dr. Sidhu for his thoughts first? How do we combine those strengths? Uh, Dr. Sidhu, did you want to speak process. to that? Yeah. So uh, I think uh, the only way to to uh, combine the strength is uh, uh, in, in because in my past experience working with these collaborative projects and uh, and where where we can even like like for us uh, direct seeding in northwest India if I'm talking about is is like now picking up. But if you travel in Australia and you can see kilometers and kilometers on the side of the road and drag seeding uh, of various crops where, where you can say a lot of uh, residue on the surface and, and next crop is coming up. And now it's picking up in uh, North India. But at the same time, I think uh, because now, now the market is opening and uh, people are aware about, uh, about, uh, about their soil health, environment, even if there is a sensitivity about water also, and and they are they are doing uh, they are coming up to try new things. I think uh, we should also work on carbon farming because because we are adding a lot of residue back to the soil and uh, and uh, our soil organ carbon carbon is improving and we can grow the same or more crops with less water as far as like. Uh, uh, High Commission was talking about uh, weather or climate change or climate smart agriculture. So I think uh, those are the possibility where where both the countries or from uh, countries and the institutions from the uh, both the countries can collaborate and to bring uh, like um, I, I think still we we have a challenge of uh, sustainability of agriculture uh, as a in 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 the region. Yes. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Situ. So sort of one way is to embed technology in sustainable farming practices in and of themselves. And um, Sachin, did you did you have thoughts on that question? The best way I would feel is uh, more and more collaboration is through bringing a lot of uh, growers, uh, technology companies and uh, consultants to India explain them the potential what is possible here and where the country is starting so i think that will open up uh, uh, the view towards this country and also do some market study and uh, showcase that people are willing to pay top dollars for a good quality product and uh, there is there is a good demand for uh, safe produce and uh, i think more and more uh, uh, big growing companies if they look at india 
for their export operations from India to the Europe or UK or Middle East from India, that kind of collaboration would also be very helpful because the proximity from Australia to Middle East versus India to Middle East. And if the, com the companies in Australia wants to collaborate here and have a partner here and work together, I think that will also be a very uh, good uh, way of uh, exploring the market and uh, pushing it forward. Thanks so much. So it sounds like technology also plays a really key role in terms of connecting the agriculture sector with consumers, not only in India, but internationally. And Vishal, especially given your background um, in investment and finance, um, what are your thoughts on the question? Yeah, so basically, uh, as I uh, said in my speech as well, the, 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 the actual farmers are, you know, having marginal land holdings. So they are, they are poor on the finance and on the technology side. And the worst worry that they have is uh, they can produce something, but where do they market? So definitely a hand holding is required, uh, you know, to connect them with the market. And as Sachin said, you know, corporate farming is something that can be looked at where overseas company can set base in India and uh, do uh, grow in India and export it out because India is more nearer to the, uh, to the Western world. Secondly, uh, what can be looked at is uh, technologies uh, that can come in. So again, what Sachin said, you know, farmers uh, that can come together and uh, explain the farmers in India, uh, or maybe via uh, via center of excellence that can be discussed. So it's more of handholding that is required at this moment of time. Uh, our farmers are more entrepreneurial, uh, especially in the West where we are from, in Gujarat and all. They're happy to take uh, challenges and do newer products. So it's just uh, proper timing of what has to be grown, where it has to be marketed, that can be looked at. So uh, it can do wonders. Thank you so much. And it's it's great to hear that as well as needing to focus on the sort of production side, there's a real opportunity for technology um, to help farmers in marketing their products and, and reaching um, end consumers. Um, and so for the next question, I'd like to ask Shreyas um, to ask the question that they've sent through. Do we have Shreyas on the line? Uh, yes, sir. thank you. Yeah, the, the, first of all, uh, thanks to Barry and team for, for putting together their uh, wonderful topic, uh, which is the need of the hour. On the one side, we have India, a huge consumer. Uh, and on the other side, we have Australia, which has the technology. Uh, so my question is very related to what have been discussed uh, by Sachin and uh, Vishal. Uh, like, if one wants to know about uh, how to find uh, a information about any kind of a collaboration uh, between India and uh, Australia, especially in the agri-tech sector, are there any programs uh, which are running? Uh, the reason why I'm asking this question is I come from an agriculture background and uh, uh, I've been working with uh, investment banking and uh, angel investing industry. Now, uh, my roots are calling me back and I want to do something and I would definitely like to use something uh, uh, which is modernized and not go back to the same method. Uh, and I know that Australia is the place. As, so my question is, where can I get that information? Thanks, thanks Trace, for the question. The easiest answer is to uh, visit the Austrade website. Austrade is Australia's trade and investment arm. So they, they are there uh, trying to connect uh, investors and businesses uh, with each other between both uh, India and Australia. Um, uh, and that's the best place to, to start. Uh, and we have uh, agricultural trade commissioners here who could probably also uh, assist. Uh, beyond that, uh, the cooperation, the collaboration is at a research institution uh, or, or government to government level, uh, where there are many things that have been happening, including uh, happily uh, Dr. Sidhu's uh, happy cedar, not the sad cedar, the happy cedar. Uh, which is a collaboration through the Australian Council of International Agricultural Research. But I think in the first instance, if you log on Austrade, uh, East India or Austrade, South Asia, uh, you'll, you'll have connections there. And if you have trouble, just get in touch with the High Commission and we can help.
No, nope. okay, we'll go on to our next question. Uh, and that is, is there any prospect for Australian interventions in the fisheries and high tech aquaculture sector in India? Hi, Commissioner, did you want to make a brief comment oh, on sorry. that one? <laughs> I was I was just monitoring the chat line. So uh, I'm trying to do two things at once. Look, look, you know, Australia is making a substantial a contribution to India's fishery uh, sector, um, and that includes a collaboration arrangement between Austrade uh, and the Tamil Nadu Department of Fisheries, which has led to establishing institutional ties between on fishing research and development uh, between Tamil Nadu Fisheries University and the Cook uh, James Cook University and Curtin Universities in Australia on sustainable uh, fisheries management and, and aqu aqu aquaculture. We've also got uh, a company here, an Australian company here in India, uh, which is working with uh, fish producers or fish farmers uh, to assist them in making decisions about the management uh, uh, of uh, uh, of their shrimp uh, crops. So, so there's both commercial and educational ties that uh, that are happening here, um, which is all designed to boost the aquaculture connection between our two countries. Thanks, High Commissioner. Okay, now for this next question, I'm hoping I can be a little sneaky and ask if our Agriculture Councillor might want to uh, make any comments on it. Uh, and the question was sent through by Jitendra Kumar and it was, what um, collaboration opportunities are there for Australia in Indian cotton farming? We'll see. We've got him at the edge of edge of our video screens. We'll just sorry, try sorry, and add in our colleague. Uh, this is John Southwell, our agriculture councillor. Uh, hello and good evening, everyone, and Namaskar. Um, actually, coming from a cotton growing region in Australia, uh, I can certainly say there is much more scope for collaboration in cl uh, cotton farming between Australia and India. Um, our bilateral research program, the Australia India Strategic Research Fund has funded a number of pieces of research to benefit Australian cotton growers and Indian cotton growers as well. And this was a project between the University of Queensland and the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, uh, which has jointly funded work to develop a eco-friendly alternative to conventional chemical insecticides that control pests that damage cotton, including the cotton bollworm. Um, and collaboration also exists between Australia and India um, in cotton farming at a multilateral level where we work together in, uh, in multi-government uh, forums. Uh, and that is both at the International Co Cotton Advisory Committee to ensure a consistent approach across the world, as well as with the uh, trading firms uh, and members of the uh, International Cotton Association. Uh, so a lot of collaboration already but uh, there can be more. Thanks so much, John. Okay, and for the next question, do we have Sachin Tendulkar to ask this question? On the line? Hello? Uh, uh, I have a, uh, internet connectivity, so maybe you won't be able to see me. Uh, thanks to Australian High Commission and Mr. Farrell for this opportunity. Actually, I have a question which can benefit uh, small farmers from point of uh, climate change. Because as we see, uh, future will be for climate smart agriculture. And can we get some assistance, Australian research institutions? India, that's a thing, I think. And if, if there is some technology or research that can definitely benefit the small farmers. Yeah. Second, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, Australia, including today, is always happy to share uh, policy approaches with, uh, with counterpart agencies in India. Australian farmers can take advantage of a carbon farming initiative, uh, which is a voluntary carbon offset scheme that exists in Australia. It allows land managers to earn carbon credits by changing land use or management practices to store carbon or reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And 
It's an integral part of Australia's emissions reduction fund, which provides incentives to a range of organisations and individuals to adapt and adopt new practices and technologies that seek to reduce uh, emissions. And of course, far the farming sector is um, is a key target of this. So uh, we have regular interactions between our departments of agriculture, our departments that are engaged with climate change. Uh, we're happy to you know, share our policy learnings uh, on this, this attempt to get farmers more involved in in uh, emission reductions by providing incentives, uh, which may be of interest to the Indian government. Thank you so much, High Commissioner. And for this next question, uh, I'd like to pass this to two of our panelists. So Vishal and Sachin, listen out, I'll be passing this to you. And the question that we've received is, how um, is it possible to invest in farming in Australia? Um, so any any comments first um, from Sachin? Uh, I mean, uh, Australia, as we all know, there is a very large acreage of land and a lot of technology and skill set is available. I think if anybody is very serious about uh, taking large scale uh, farming there, 5,000 hectares, 10,000 hectares kind of uh, area, I think there is beautiful scope to do cotton and uh, other uh, broad acre crops there. Land is uh, available, uh, infrastructure is there. I think it's just about uh, reaching out to the companies there who are already into the space. And I don't think they will mind if uh, somebody is willing to invest and want to do a, a bigger uh, land with a forward integration with India for textile industries, for the cotton or any other products. I think, I think it's just about to uh, find out the people who are already there in this trade and uh, partner with them. Thanks so much, Sachin. And Vishal, did you have any comments on investing in farming in Australia? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So just to add on what Sachin said, uh, there is a lot of farmland available in uh, Australia and it's, it's a big parcel of land. It's just about time, you know, uh, just need to study on what you want to do. Like oil seeds are something that can be grown out there like Canola is something that's grown in Australia and processed out there. Then there's mung beans, uh, uh, chickpeas that's grown and imported into India. So, uh, yeah, so a collaboration can be done and a forward or a backward integration. Uh, and it's uh, the policies are quite easy and simple in Australia vis-a-vis -vis India. So, yeah, it can be looked at. Thanks very much, Vishal. And just finally, I'll just pass to the High Commissioner to, to speak to that as well about what the opportunities are for investors. I, th I think Vishal and Sachin have been great uh, adver advertisements and, and advocates of what, what can be done. So I have nothing to add to what they say, but I don't, wanted to make a point that a former Minister for Agriculture in Australia used to highlight, which is don't overlook the counter-seasonal opportunities that exist in India. So if you're a grower of uh, oilseed in India, uh, in your off-season here in India, uh, the, it's the right season to grow up in Australia. So you could actually, uh, by investing in Australia, uh, uh, ensure that you have 12 months round uh, uh, production just as Sachin has under under his conditions uh, uh, there in Hyderabad. So I think sometimes it's forgotten that uh, Australia's in another hemisphere. Uh, its seasons are opposite to those seasons that exist in India. And for some of these crops, you could, as an enterprise, commercial enterprise, or even a farmer enterprise, uh, run two seasons, get two seasons a year uh, by investing in Australia. Thanks, High Commissioner. Um, and our next question, our next question, uh, Dr. Sidhu, I'll be throwing to you. Um, the question we've received is. Um, what opportunity is there to introduce Australian post-harvest processing machines into India? Um, Dr. Sidhu, do you have any thoughts on that? On, on the post-harvest, yes. Like uh, still, if, if we talk about like the, the, the grains produced here in the North India, either it is a rice or maize and, and or, or wheat, still, still we have a uh, still, we have a, a lot of uh, uh, post-harvest assistance is required because selling a grain and selling uh, a 
a, a, a processed uh, processed uh, product is not only adding a value to to uh, to the to the system but at the same time it is also creating job opportunities for many so i think uh, this is this is another area where where if we can we can because because uh, in the in the farmer sector there are cooperative societies if we empower those cooperative societies who can process uh, with the with the small processing unit so so that those units can can uh, can take care of their vicinity so that the transportation as well as handling costs should not be more i think there is there are, there are a lot of opportunities on on that front also yeah even even like like more importantly for small and uh, marginal farms because because they otherwise they are selling their grains into into uh, in the market yes thanks very much and i think our high commissioner has a follow up question for you well, well it's not directly connected dr city but your magnificent video earlier about the happy cedar where we saw a crop harvested and a crop planted at the same time i just wondered way back yeah. in my my geography and science studies back at school so it's a long time ago when when how do you deal with the soil how what stage in that process does the soil get the rest that uh, was always encouraged back when I was uh, learning anything about uh, soil? I don't think I don't think if you see uh, in the in the not natural farming uh, uh, because uh, if it is uh, if it is a fully irrigated system uh, and uh, and hundred uh, percent irrigation it every season. And uh, now, if you see in in the North India, the cropping intensity is almost two hundred percent, almost two hundred percent. Even even uh, there are some some places in in uh, uh, in uh, in Punjab where people are taking not only two crops but at the same taking three crops, potato, rice, and maize uh, in in a one year. So so the cropping intensity is like like. The how how much they can get out of a unit uh, area is uh, is a is a target. But at the same time, we should also take care of uh, soil health. So what we are we are uh, we are promoting under my video also and under under this system. Soil, which is which is a very practice and and we are saving on or almost 25 percent of water uh, uh, with this practice but but more importantly uh, I hope I go, it's we can still hear you dr Sidhu. I think he's having network issues, Lauren. Sorry. No worries. Thanks very much, Hema. Okay, everyone, we have a couple more minutes. Um, so if anyone else that's listening in this evening um, has a question or a comment that they'd like to share or ask, um, drop us a line in the comment section. Um, and we'll be happy to, to take that up and put it either to our panelists or to the High Commissioner. Dr. Sidhu's back. Dr. Sidhu, we have you back again. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, sorry. My 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 connection was like suddenly bad, uh, turned into bad. Uh, so what I why I, I was I was trying to say that like like uh, there must be a, a reward for ecosystem and for public health services, uh, especially in the area of uh, this like. Oh, uh, field crops, so so uh, so that people uh, can come forward uh, to to not only to save water to save their soil health, but uh, at the same time uh, producing more with the same or with the uh, with the with the less. So there must be some uh, reward system if we are uh, if there is a eco uh, eco ecosystem. And public health services. If we are if we are contributing to 
to the public uh, with, uh, uh, with with this system. That's all. Sorry, my connection is again getting bad. And okay. no, thank you so much. Okay, thanks everyone. I think we've come to the end of our questions for this evening's session, but we're so grateful um, for those questions that you have sent through um, and the conversation that we've been able to have um, with our panelists this evening. Uh, so thank you, High Commissioner, and thank you, Dr. Sidhu, Sachin. Dr. Sidhu had his finger up. Oh, sorry, we have one more one more question, do we, Dr. Sidhu? I, I was I just trying to yeah, I, I was just trying to respond to the High Commission question that uh, he wants some rest for the soil. In the natural system, in the in the forest, the soil is always working, right? So, so it is always 100% time on the plantation. So I think uh, <laughs> that is my answer. Point, point made, yeah. point made. Yeah. Thanks yeah. very much. Um, so thank you, thank High you. Commissioner. Thank you, Dr. Sidhu, especially for for um, for battling internet challenges and, and answering all of our questions this evening. Thank you, Sachin. Thank you, Vishal, for joining us. Um, and thank you to all of our participants who have given us their time and made the effort to, to join us this evening. Um, we'd also like to acknowledge the efforts of the Australian Alumni Association of India and its chapters across the country um, that are keeping us all connected, even at this time. And before we sign off, we'd like to ask if our audience members can either put on their video or keep on their video um, so that perhaps we can get a quick photo with you all. Um, so feel free to do something creative on screen at the moment if you're feeling inspired. If you have any agricultural products that you'd like to hold in your, <laughs> in your video, that's fine. And we'll see if we can get a quick photo. Um, all right, great. I'll take it in this time. Him, are you able to take that photo? I'll take one just in case. Yeah, we're getting the photos. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. We've got a big wide view of you now. Sounds good, product. <laughs> Simply fresh. Uh, great. Good advertising. Good, good advertising. <laughs> That's that promotion and marketing we were talking about earlier. All that, right, that thanks so much. Advice. Give that man a strawberry. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Um, and we'd also like to take the opportunity to remind you that we've sent you all a feedback form, and we'd really appreciate it if you could spare a few minutes um, to give us your input on how you found these sessions, how we can make them more interesting, more engaging, and more useful. Um, and we'd also like to ask you to share details um, of these events with other alumni that you know and encourage them to join in, especially in, um, in our conversations and Q&A sessions. Um, and thank you once again. Stay safe, stay well, until we meet again for the next episode of Stay Connected, Stay Informed and Shape the Future. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you.